Jazz Fimingo of the University of Ottawa. My theme today is International Men's Day. About a month ago, an article came out in the Guardian newspaper advocating the end of manhood. It's another one of the purportedly progressive opinion pieces, more and more common lately, it seems, that have to be read two or three times to check that they aren't satire. They're so intellectually vacuous and dishonest. In this case, writer Zach Stafford alleges that it's, quote, time to do away with the concept of manhood altogether, because manhood, according to Stafford, has produced only, quote, centuries of war, of pillaging, of violence. Men today commit significantly more violent crime than women, Stafford alleges, and they, well, there wasn't really much else to his article except that according to one study, men show anger in the workplace more than women and, you guessed it, take up too much space on the subway. Stafford also asserted that there is an endless rape problem on college campuses because men can't recognize women's humanity. One wonders, how did you get to be so sensitive, Zach? The article is so foolish that it doesn't really deserve a serious response, except that it represents a widespread mindset of our contemporary culture, that women have it so bad, that men are to blame for female suffering, and that we'd all be better off if manhood were jettisoned. Actually, the exact reverse is true. Women as a class have it very good. Men as a class deserve daily gratitude. And if we could put an end to manhood, by which I'm assuming Stafford meant traditionally masculine traits such as risk-taking, competitiveness, physical courage, problem-solving, rationality, self-reliance, daring, and curiosity, if we could put an end to all that, we'd never cease regretting it. So let me suggest just a few ways that manhood so defined, far from being a problem we need to fix, is a precious resource that we weaken at our collective peril. Throughout human history, it is true that manhood has been associated with violence. For millennia, our world was, and still is to some extent, an extremely dangerous place in which our species would not have fared well if men had not been willing and able to kill. More remarkably, though, manhood has been distinctively associated with creation. While women contributed to humanity by bearing and nurturing children, men created environments in which women and children could survive and thrive. Men codified morality, created art, philosophy, and machines, and developed ever more sophisticated systems of law and government. Perhaps because the male role in procreation was invisible, men excelled at creating beauty. In paintings by such masters as Giotto, Cimabui, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, Caravaggio, Rembrandt, Monet, and Van Gogh. In the musical masterpieces of Bach, Handel, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt, Verdi, Puccini, Rachmaninoff, Brahms, and Tchaikovsky. And in the literary classics of Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Swift, Wordsworth, Byron, Shelley, Blake, Dickens, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Proust, Melville, and Hemingway. Astonishing works of intellectual and spiritual exploration were produced by philosophers such as Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, John Locke, David Hume, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Adam Smith, René Descartes, and Immanuel Kant. There's no female list that could come anywhere near to rivaling this canon of great artists and thinkers. And these magnificent developments in creativity and expression were accompanied by a flourishing of science-based achievements, without which our lives today would be almost unimaginably different from what they are, nasty, brutish, and short, as Thomas Hobbes said, and without which there could never have been any feminist movement at all no freeing improvement in the lives of women to make it possible for women to challenge men politically or artistically. 
It has been men who sought to unlock the mysteries of the universe and who found ways to transform the material world into marvelous life-saving inventions. Observing the heavens and calculating the relation of planetary bodies, Nicholas Copernicus propounded the heliocentric universe. The great Galileo made a plethora of contributions to observational astronomy, and Sir Isaac Newton formulated the laws of motion and universal gravitation. In the realms of medicine and technology, men radically altered the culture. Edward Jenner discovered a vaccine for smallpox. Gregor Mendel made paradigm-altering discoveries in genetics. Charles Darwin shook the world with his theory of evolution. Louis Pasteur discovered pasteurization as well as life-saving vaccines. Thomas Edison gave us the practical and inexpensive light bulb. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. Nikola Tesla created the radio. Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. Elihu Thompson invented the electric welding process. Charles Parson created the steam turbine. Gottlieb Daimler conceived the gasoline-powered automobile engine. Uh, Giuliano Marconi brought us the wireless telegraph. Wilhelm Rontgen devised x-rays. And Albert Einstein formulated the theory of relativity. Feminists will say, well, those inventions and discoveries, and of course I've named only a tiny, tiny fraction, were made at a time when women were kept out of the various fields of scientific knowledge and endeavor. But male privilege certainly does not account for the fact that it is to men that we owe pretty much entirely the present operation and maintenance of the vast, intricate civilizational system men created. As Janet Bloomfield documented in a brilliant 2013 article, thank you, Janet, if men all decided to stay home for a day, our whole society would become unlivable almost immediately. Using U.S. Department of Labor statistics as evidence, she shows that it is almost entirely men who are the electrical engineers responsible for our power grid, it is men who are the electrical plant operators who keep it running. It is men who are the water treatment engineers who make sure that drinkable water comes out of our taps and that we can flush our toilets. Men are the aircraft pilots and air traffic controllers who make travel possible. They are also the locomotive engineers who keep the trains running. Similarly, we owe our telecommunication system almost entirely to men. They are the computer systems designers and operators, the telecommunications installers and repairers. In addition, men are the air conditioning and furnace mechanics, the designers, builders, and maintainers of all our household appliances. And men are the workers in the entire production, transportation, and materials moving occupations. As Bloomfield notes, without man, essentially, quote, nothing would be built or extracted from the earth, and, quote, nothing would be installed, maintained, or repaired. Male privilege, the feminists insist. But it isn't so. Men are the unsung heroes of our whole system of production, distribution, and maintenance. They're the ones who do the jobs nobody wants to do, the jobs that no feminist laments over women's denied access. Throughout history, of course, men have always been expected to sacrifice their bodies in labor and to sacrifice their lives in war in return for the misery of most men's lives and their expendability in their societies. They got at least bare respect as men. That's now gone. Men are no longer respected as men, but the reality of little regarded, little noticed male sacrifice continues today. It is men who do the most dangerous work, the hardest, dirtiest, and least pleasant, poorly paid, and most necessary work in the slaughterhouses and in the meat packing and meat preparation plants, in garbage disposal and processing in sewage systems maintenance and repair, in recyclables collection, in janitorial work, in road maintenance, in roof repair and general building repair, in construction work and in the work of construction preparation, on farms and in commercial fishing and logging operations, in firefighting and security work, in technical repair and maintenance of all sorts, in power plants, 
in food processing, in long haul trucking, in iron and steel work, and in mining. These jobs, which are often difficult and boring and painful, and are often performed in inclement weather or uncomfortable conditions of noise, heat, muck, and bad smells, involve long hours, close contact with heavy machinery and equipment, and often low wages. Very few women are able to do such work or care to do it. And the fact that such almost exclusively male work involves, not surprisingly, the highest injury and fatality rate in the North American workforce is almost never discussed. Some privilege, some power. The men who do such work deserve our respect and gratitude every day. The fact of the matter is that without male ingenuity, male generosity, and male sacrifice throughout history and in daily life today, all our lives would be vastly diminished, far poorer, far uglier, far more difficult, and far more dangerous. Women expect men to go on doing what men have always done, maintaining our transportation and communication systems, protecting us against terrorism and social breakdown, finding cures for disease, inventing new technologies, building and monitoring our homes and the many products we use in them, making sure we have electricity, running water, and a functioning sewage system, providing us with an incredible array of foods to eat and technologies to store and prepare them. Increasingly, men's reward for all this is animosity and contempt and calls for male removal from the most pleasant and most rewarding jobs where women want to dominate. This ignorant animus against men starts in the public schools and spreads through higher education, the entertainment industry, the justice system, and the mass media, widely colluded in by both men and women. I sometimes think that we're in the grip of a mass cultural neurosis so blinding and severe that only the complete destruction of our civilization will wake us to its dimensions. There could be no more certain way to guarantee our doom than, as that jackass Zach Stafford advocates, to, quote, do away with manhood. On the contrary, we'd better start recognizing and applauding it. After recording this episode, I learned that at the University of York in England, an International Men's Day event has been cancelled. Why? Because following an online statement by Adrian Lee, who serves on the university's Equality and Diversity Committee, a group of feminist students and faculty took offence. Lee had highlighted barriers to men's equality at the U of York in his statement, and the students and faculty protested that that was misogynistic. They wrote an angry group letter and the university quickly canceled the event in response. That's right. Even on International Men's Day, the one day out of the 365 when one would think that issues of men might be honestly addressed, even on that day, it is still forbidden to speak the truth. So what do you call a mindset that holds to its own imaginary truth no matter the evidence to the contrary? What do you call a mindset that viciously attacks anyone who points to that evidence? What do you call a theory of the world that insists on male malice, no matter how much fact-based analysis shows it just isn't the case? I was talking about this with a friend just the other day, and we agreed. You have to call it madness. And when it's a cultural madness so widespread and with such far-reaching impacts, you wonder how long the culture can continue in any semblance of health. I'm not optimistic, frankly, about our long-term prospects if we keep on as we are. But for now, I want to personally thank men for doing what you do and for being who you are. <laughs>